Okay, so let's continue discussing our magnetic mirror configuration. Next thing I might like to talk about is uh, single particle orbits. Uh, so I've got myself a macroscopically stable system. Where do the particles actually go? Well, you know, uh, just to look back at this geometry here, um, what they're going to do is, to lowest order, just gyrate around the field lines, and then they'll bounce back and forth, the trapped particles anyway, or confined particles, between the magnetic mirrors, and then they will drift B cross grad B in the direction orthogonal to both B, which is along the z-axis, and grad B, which is more or less radial. So B cross grad B is just azimuthal. So the idea is um, that um, you would get uh, single particle orbits, which uh, are just gyro motion with a time scale delta t of order 1 over the cyclotron frequency and a spatial step of order the gyro radius um, plus bounce motion Um, which has a time scale delta t of order 1 over the bounce frequency, which would be the length over the thermal velocity, and a spatial step scale, step scale of the order of the length of the machine, just bounces back and forth. And finally, um, then the last process, or the slowest time scale, is so-called drift motion, where the delta t is of order one over the drift frequency, which is the radius over the drift velocity. Uh, and how far does it drift? Well, it drifts around more or less uh, the azimuthal, uh, well, of order 2 pi r. You know, it drifts all the way around, basically. Now, there is a little bit of a trickiness because we you know, ended up in the offy bar situation here of having not quite an axisymmetric machine. We added this cusp field in the other direction. So we made it, you know, inhomogeneous in the poloidal direction. So, or the azimuthal direction. So if I really go at the drift motion, what I find is that the drift velocity should be, if you remember, it was uh, V parallel squared plus V perp squared over 2 times B cross grad B over B squared and over cyclotron frequency. And B is more or less in the Z direction. But grad B has now both radial components and azimuthal components. And so what this leads to is an surely our usual Z cross R or azimuthal drift but also we're going to have a radial drift. That is to say, radially, it turns out the particles drift in and out. Um, so this is uh, just around in theta. Particles drift around the magnetic axis. And this is sort of in and out. And some people call this last drift a so-called geodesic curvature drift because it's caused by curvature of the magnetic field lines within the magnetic flux surface, hence to give me a grad B in the theta direction. And so it's a geodesic, uh, that's what a characteristic of a geodesic is, a variation within a flux surface. And so they call this a geodesic curvature induced drift. Okay, so that's sort of the story on particle orbits. It's, it, you know, it's almost always the same story that if you imagine uh, sort of field lines and drifts. The particles are just sort of, you know, gyrating along, sorry, uh, and then bouncing back and forth, but then they're also uh, drifting. But here they're actually drifting not just azimuthally, but also in and out a little bit. Okay, next thing we want to talk about is then, so we've got sort of MHD equilibrium, MHD stability. Uh, next thing we want to talk about is a sort of ambipolar equilibrium. And I'll just call it that, and then I'll kind of go along explaining here 
um, why it is is it's important. So let's call this the um, ambipolar uh, collisional equilibrium. Um, here what we do is we imagine we have one of these nice magnetic wells, uh, minimum B systems that we've arranged. And um, let's imagine we now throw some plasma in it. What happens? Um, so imagine it's going to decay away, and the question is how fast and how does it work. Uh, anyway, filling a magnetic mirror machine, a magnetic mirror, let's say, with a plasma composed of electrons and ions ha that has uh, oh, electron temperature of order ion temperature. Now, remember that in a magnetic mirror machine, there were some particles that might get into a loss cone, and they would be lost immediately, okay? Both electrons and ions just flow out of the system. Um, so untrapped particles or loss, uh, uh, loss cone particles uh, leave immediately. But since that, whether they leave or not, depended upon their magnetic moment, ratio of magnetic moment to energy, uh, it doesn't depend upon what charge the particle is. And as a result of that, um, exactly the same number of electrons and ions leave. So if I start out with a quasi-neutral plasma, after all the untrapped particles leave, I still have a quasi-neutral plasma. Um, and now we can then, you, you know, we know that at that time, then if we go back to our V perp, V parallel uh, diagram, we know that then I'll have, for some given mirror ratio, I'll have trapped particles only in this region, and this is the loss cone here, and this is trapped particles up here. Trapped or confined, retained particles, whatever. Now, uh, what happens next? Well, what happens next is that collisions, okay, um, scatter these particles in angle, small angle scatter, scatters an angle, you know, and it scatters particles across this boundary. So it's going to scatter particles out of the trapped region into the loss cone region. Now when it does that, does it do it the same for electrons and ions? Well, it turns out not at all. If you remember, electron collision rates were faster by square root of mass ratio than ion collision rates. So electrons scatter out, uh, well, into loss cone region more rapidly. And by the way, when they get into the loss cone region, they're gone in one transit time, which is short compared to the collision time. So they're really gone. Uh, so more rapidly than ions. So what does that mean? Well, that means that my magnetic mirror is going to be pretty soon finding it has a deficiency of electrons. They've been leaving. And so it's going to charge up positively. And how high will it go? Well, it'll go to as high a potential as it has to to hold back the electrons to leave only at the rate that the ions want to leave. So what we're going to need is for ambipolarity, you know, to retain our um, um, quasi-neutral situation, we're going to need to get that the electron loss rate, dNe dt, is approximately equal to the ion loss rate. Um, what is the electron loss? Well, what is the ion loss rate? The ion loss rate would be just, you know, minus nu i, some collision frequency for 
ions to scatter with, into the loss region. What about the electrons? Well, that would be the same thing, except that they're going to have to surmount this potential barrier, which we're going to say begins to exist. So it's e to the minus e phi over te times ne. So if I equate these two, so these are the two quantities I need. If I equate those two and solve, what you can show is that the e phi over te that you obtain is approximately the logarithm of the electron collision frequency to the ion collision frequency. It turns out that's eh, the logarithm of the square root of the ion to electron mass ratio. Remember we sort of said the electron and ion temperature of the particles we put in were about the same. And this turns out to be about 3.7. So in fact, an ambipolar potential builds up to 3.7 or so times a more exact calculation. It turns out it gives 4.7. If you really calculate the electron loss rate, you get an additional factor of T over E phi, it turns out. Um, but anyway, so a big ambipolar potential builds up. The mirror builds up to a positive potential so that it'll hold back the electrons, won't let only the highest energy electrons that are just way out on the tail of distribution function trickle over. We have to slow them way up because they're trying to scatter too rapidly. So that's uh, uh, what happens. Now, another uh, consideration, let me call it that, is that if you um, uh, look at this, you can notice that uh, often I'm trying to heat the ions, and I don't really care about the electrons. Remember, it was the ion temperature that counted for fusion. You could care less about the electrons, except they've kind of all got to be there for um, quasi-neutrality. And if they uh, have too low a temperature, then you, by collisional equilibration, will pull down the ions you're working so hard to get. But for the most part, you don't care too much. So anyway, the only point I want to make out of that is just to say that, in fact, um, the collisional scattering, the collisional, um, uh, the only way the electrons get heated in a mirror machine for the most part is you put the power into the ions and the ions collisionally heat the electrons. But when they, when they heat the electrons and the electrons leave, they leave with this potential. So they don't leave with KT. You know, the electrons that leave have to go over the top of this potential barrier. And so they leave and take out a lot of energy when they go, and they don't actually get very much. And so the net result is you can show that the ratio of the electron temperature to the average ion energy in these devices would be the fifth root of the electron to ion mass ratio, and that's about one-eighth or so. So the electrons tend to be much colder than the ions in a mirror machine. Okay, so now what we've sort of, so there's a, a number of details of the collisional scattering process which you have to go into. And by the way, intuitively, um, suppose I wanted to make better confinement. How would I do that? Um, well, in general, what you can sort of show, general, uh, is that the new is of the order of, um, I don't want to do this. No, sorry. Let's say it. The, uh, the energy containment time is of, of the order of the 90 degree scattering time, tau i, times, it turns out, the logarithm of the magnetic mirror ratio. We know that if we make a magnetic mirror ratio that's very large, that is to say the ratio of the magnetic field strength right under the mirror throat to the magnetic field strength back at the center midplane, if we made that very large, we, we in some sense are making the hole in velocity space that the particles are leaking out of smaller and smaller and smaller, if you remember that little formula. What's somewhat surprising is you don't make it better very rapidly, okay? namely logarithm of the mirror ratio. So it takes a fantastic mirror ratio. Well, is it good enough? Um, well, if you go back, you can you remember Q was this fusion quality factor, net power out over power in. And it was proportional to N tau E. 
times the various quantities of the thermal the effic efficiency for converting uh, heat to electricity, sigma V fusion over 12 Ti delta E fusion. Now, we sort of have, you know, that this is the ion collision frequent ion collision time times logarithm of uh, rm so it turns out this is n tau i times the logarithm of our mirror ratio times all those factors but now if you look back we had an ion collision time or any collision time was itself proportional to density which implies that tau i is inversely proportional to density so it turns out that the density actually cancels out of all this. And all the rest of this, you remember, was just some function of Ti. And so this turns out to be proportional to the mirror ratio. So this density cancels that one. Let me do that. Um, and this turns out to be proportional to the logarithm of the mirror ratio times some function of the ion temperature. A little bit different than it was before, but there's some function. Now, it's kind of critical if I want Q, which was net fusion power over power losses, to be greater than 1, I'd uh, like to know kind of what the real magnitude of this is. And the answer there is somewhat unfortunate, um, because it turns out that this is of order 1 for a mirror ratio of about 4, and so, you know, if I made a mirror ratio of 10, well, you know, I get a Q of 1.5 or something like that. But if I really wanted, it turns out you would say, well, if I just produce more power than I put in, that's enough. But really, uh, people who make real systems, real thermodynamic systems, real power plant systems, they say, well, really, you know, I ought to have some fairly high efficiency here that, that uh, you know, 10 to 1 or something like that would be kind of nice. Uh, so let's say would like Q of order 10 or greater. Well, this would imply how high a mirror ratio? Well, it turns out it would imply a mirror ratio of greater than 10 to the 4th. And that's the mirror ratio, you remember, was the ratio of the magnetic field strength under the magnetic mirror throat to that at the center. And that's, uh, let's just say, not credible. Uh, you know, 10,000 times is a, is a little kind of a huge mirror. And then you end up with such a low magnetic field that you almost don't have gyro radii. Uh, you know, the gyro radius becomes very, very large. So the simple mirror we've then gone through a series of arguments and basically said it <coughs> can work in the sense of if you put on the Offy bars you get a minimum B system. However, it doesn't produce net power. So what do people do? Well, what they did is a few years ago they invented a, a slightly different concept which is called the uh, tandem mirror concept. And the idea was to have a mirror, which in this case is more or less homogeneous and, and uh, uh, azimuthally symmetric. And then they used magnetic mirrors at the end of it um, to produce what are called plugs. Oops, this one has to go this way. Drawing all these things is a bit of a challenge. But. So that's a plug. So this is called a plug. And this is called a central cell. And then we've got to have a plug on the other end. And that's going to be somewhat hard to draw symmetrically. But we'll try. And then what you do is you put into the end plugs, or as they're called, uh, very, very high, high density and high fields, okay, hot uh, kind of plugs, hot plasmas. 
Now, wherever you put hot ion plasmas, it turns out you will high-density hot ion plasmas. You'll have some electrons there, and those electrons will help you build up an ambipolar potential throughout the device. So if I look at the ambipolar potential, phi, as a function of distance along this device, in the plug, okay, it'll build up to some relatively high value, and then in the other plug, it'll build up to another high value. Now what happens? Well, what sort of happens is that I can um, confine some particles, uh, namely ions, in the central region, so let's call this warm, now not as hot as the plugs, uh, ions in central cell. However, they're now confined not by the magnetic field, but the mirroring is produced by an electrostatic potential. So it's confined by electrostatic potential. Yeah. Of the end plugs. And how are the end plugs, the, the hot ions in the end plugs confined? Well, the plugs are, you know, mag, uh, the ions in those are magnetically confined. Um, so magnetically confined. Now, it turns out if you do this, all of this, you can say, well, Q turns out to then be about 5 to 8 for these systems. One of the reasons why it's not higher is if you look at this potential, you can say, you know, ions are trapped in that potential. If I want to look at electrons, where do they go? I, I flip the, in some sense, because of the sign of charge, I, I flip the, how the potential looks, and the electrons you see go all the way out. So what people invented as a further thing on this is they came along and said, well, what I really need is an additional piece, which is called a thermal barrier. So it's an additional half a plug in here, sort of thing, okay, which causes a dip in the potential. This is called a thermal barrier. Electron thermal energy barrier. Oh, and the plugs, by the way, you make minimum B whereas the central cell you make axisymmetric, but that's nuance here at the moment uh, and not always true. Uh, so with thermal barriers, um, it would appear that the optimum or possible or whatever you want to call it would be Q of order 10 to 20, possible in some reactor scheme or something. Um, so what you see in all this is a kind of evolution, let's say, of the concept from a simple mirror, axisymmetric, but we had to make it MHD stable, so we put on the offy bars. Then after that, we uh, said, well, it didn't get high enough, perhaps fusion Q, to make net power, so we'll kind of rearrange the system elements, so we put plugs on the end of a long central cell. And then finally... Well, that wasn't quite good enough, so we put in thermal barriers as well. Now, there's one additional topic which is important in mirror machines that I need to mention briefly, and that's the subject of so-called micro-instabilities in all of these types of mirrors and tandem mirrors. The basic idea is if you look at our V-perp, V-parallel distribution, we have particles only confined at non-zero energies. So if I make a plot of the distribution function as a function of that V perp, you know that it's going to have to have zero particles here at V perp equals zero, go up and then back down. Can't have infinite energy. So it has a positive slope region. 
So this is a region where df dv perp is greater than zero, and that leads to instabilities or micro instabilities. Micro because they're in the velocity distribution, not in the macroscopics of a fluid uh, treatment. What type of instabilities? Well, it's sort of like a maser or laser instability. You take energy out of high energy particles, put it into a wave, uh, you know, and therefore amplify the wave. So basically it's pull the particles down in energy. Um, this, uh, oh, anyway, and these instabilities go by the names of uh, loss cone, um, uh, cyclotron or drift cyclotron, uh, or drift cone, uh, drift meaning you put in a little bit of inhomogeneity, uh, micro instabilities. The basic idea is that these things cause, can cause a lot of problems. What people have done to cure them is they sometimes put in an additional so-called warm plasma component, which is an additional component so that the overall distribution function doesn't do that. So there's all kinds of these little things. The net situation on tandem mirrors is that because of some asymmetry effects and some particular, um, some flute-like modes in these tandem mirrors and these loss cone instabilities, the combinations of those have made it difficult to get end tiles above about 10 to the 10th, 10 to the 11th range and temperatures in the few kilovolts. So uh, when a budget crunch came uh, in the funding of fusion programs, about four or five years ago, three or four years ago, the fusion program decided to basically drop the big tandem mirror experiments. At this moment, the Phaedrus experiment here at Wisconsin is one of the few, if not in the United States, it's the only tandem mirror experiment surviving. There's some in Japan and the Soviet Union. So next time we'll talk about tokamaks. This concludes what I want to say about mirror machines. <laughs>